Uh, welcome everybody. Um, this is a, an, an odd sort of event uh, because it, it's it's the experimental phase of the the brave new uh, world of the King's Maritime History Seminars, where we um, we're using the, the power of technology to get uh, speakers from around the world uh, to give us um, to give us some talks. So thank you um, to everybody online and the few people who have come in. Uh, in person to this uh, King's uh, Maritime History Seminar. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of the Lawton Inn unit uh, here in the Department of War Studies and the School of Security Studies uh, at King's. We are your hosts, and it's the British Commission for Maritime History, of course, um, who have organized uh, this event as always, and with uh, the support of the Society for Nautical uh, Research, for which we're very uh, grateful, and uh, Lloyd's uh, register. Tonight I'm really pleased to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Sam uh, McLean, who is uh, just an all-around uh, good chap who, uh, well he's not just that, he is that, but he's more. He's uh, graduated with a PhD uh, from King's School. When was that? Recently, exactly, and has been plying his trade as a mariner, as I understand it, on the Great Lakes. Um, which is all very exciting, which is something that uh, I'd like to catch up with him about uh, some time. He's also been busy doing all sorts of historical work for global maritime uh, history and uh, working uh, with uh, documents in, in a way that I won't pretend to understand, um, nor do I need to, because he's here to explain it all uh, to us. Um, and it, it does look exciting. And so, I will, I don't think I've forgotten anything else. So I will, uh, without any further uh, ado, hand, um, hand over to you uh, with our thanks, uh, Sam. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's very nice to be able to join this seminar series once more, albeit from several thousand kilometers and several time zones away. Um, today I'm talking, I will be talking about my ADM8 uh, database project and some of the more recent things that I have been doing with it. Um, so the, I, the first thing I, I will be doing is talking a little, little bit about the ADM8 as a, a series of manuscripts. Uh, then I'll be talking about the database pro project and the documents. There will be a, a short introduction to the database itself, um, a very short look at the basic functions of the research tool that I've created. Uh, and then I'm going to have a more lengthy discussion of, um, well, basically, I have a bunch of really interesting graphs, I think, to show everybody. Um, I hope that everybody in the room uh, can sit closer to the front so they can see. And I hope that I will suggest that everybody who is on their computer will probably want the full screen on your best screen, uh, because uh, the, I will be zooming in on the graphs as much as I can. So in 2017, after I finished my PhD, uh, I realized that there'd be no practical way for me to continue working on, uh, I, I argued that the Royal Navy had a Westminster model constitution and I just, I had moved home to Canada so I couldn't continue working on that project. Um, and so I came up with the idea of the ADM8 database um, after I received photos of volumes one and two um, from David Davies, uh, who, to whom I owe many things. Uh, so he is both the photographer and the hand model, you'll see in several of the images later. Um, the point of the ADM, ADM8 database is to make the volumes more accessible to researchers. One part of that is in transcribing the reports and putting them online, but more importantly, both to the conception of the project and to the useful of the research tool was to put the, the strengths of a database to work and allow researchers to access and organize the information within ADM8 uh, differently, more coherently, and more easily than could just be achieved using the documents uh, themselves in person. So what is ADM8? Uh, it is a series of, of Admiralty Manuscript documents that are held at Q. Uh, and I will put the first one on the screen. Hopefully you can see that now. Uh, so these are list books that contain several different types of reports. Um, at the moment, the, the pro I'm, me and my colleague, Larry Herzl, who, are, who is doing a lot of the transcription, we're focusing just on the what we call deployment reports. And so these are monthly reports or monthly or every two weeks or every so often 
of where the ships in the Royal Navy are, uh, what ships are in service, where they are, what they're doing, who's the captain, those kinds of things. Now, I, I don't know when these volumes were actually created or bound up. Um, if I may present David Davies' suspicions, it's probably early 19th century under Thomas Corbett, um, who is responsible for the Corbett volumes and other resources. I think they seem to be copies of reports, although I might be incorrect. Um, they are not perfect copies by any means. Often things are scratched out or there are notes added to documents afterwards. And there's also um, some issues with the, with the documents that I'll be describing later. So exploring the ADM-8 documents. Uh, so the, the one that we're fo focusing on the moment is what we call a deployment report. So in the first and second volumes, there are about 300 individual documents or reports total. At the moment, we are focusing on the, on the deployment reports because they are approximately 250 of the 300. Uh, at the moment, we have 159 reports live in our database on the website that can be accessed by researchers. And about 154 of those, I believe, are deployment reports. Now, they, they, the deployment reports come in a, a number of different structures and styles, some with more information, some with less. Um, the styles are, tend to go on for a certain period of time and then change. Some changes last longer than others. Um, I'm only going to show you two different structures of deployment report, um, mainly because if I showed you all of them, it would take forever. Now, all of these deployment reports contain listings of the ship name and captain name. Other fields that are often included include men, guns, rate, lieutenants, date and service, date cleaned, station, where at present, and where laid up or where, where paid off. Uh, often reports will have up to two location um, categories, but no more than that. So up on the screen, we see the first one. This is a report from February of 1673. So actually it's February of 1674. Uh, and this is one of the more basic structures for a deployment report as, for example, it doesn't have lieutenants and it doesn't have rate. Um, and here it has says how employed, but in the database we use that as station. Uh, so th this is one of the simpler reports. Oops. Sorry, I'm just trying to figure out, oh, here we go. So th this, as I'm showing you now, hopefully you can see, um, is a second type of deployment report. As you can see, it has different categories. Uh, guns is no longer there, but it has, at least on the left side, it has where at present and station designed, which are both location categories. And on the right side, you can see that it has a completely different structure called in ordinary. Uh, me not many reports have list the ships that are in order are in ordinary or out of service. Um, and so this is from August of 1674. However, I, I wanted to show you this one just as you can see uh, some of the some of the differences. I've actually had to rewrite the, the way that the database works recently so that we can more accurately show uh, the different different structures in our reports. Now there, there are some weaknesses in the data um, in terms of creating or looking at social networks. Um, the first is that the information listed per ship is quite limited, especially when it comes to the number of officers that are named per ship. Um, the, the most I've ever seen is two captains and three lieutenants, uh, but often it is a captain and a, and a lieutenant or just a captain or just a lieutenant, depending on what's going on. So this provides a not very little information, but it, it provides, I'd say, the, the minimum amount of information needed to uh, try to construe connections between officers, as I'll be showing you later with the graphs. Now, th there's also some other issues um, with the volume itself. Uh, for example, there's errors in transcription. Um, there's one fellow who shows up quite a few times called Edward Wheeler. Um, unfortunately, I can't find any proof either in ADM 1010 or ADM 1015, which are officer lists. Um, and I, I actually also asked David Davies and we asked Peter Lefebvre about whether he exists. In, so th there is, it's interesting that there's a, a number of these issues is 20 or 30 lines where this name Edward Wheeler pops up, uh, but we have no proof that he actually existed as an officer. 
Uh, and there's also another issue with mis misbound pages, particularly in volume one, uh, where in the middle of 1674, a random page shows up, which actually belongs into, uh, actually should be in 1678. Um, so I've only noticed that one, but there, there is some issues which can, prove, can um, prove to be challenging for researchers looking at the database or looking at the documents rather. Thankfully, we were able to sort it out and the information is stored correctly in the database. So about the database itself. So as I mentioned, we have 159 live reports. Uh, about 154 of them are deployment reports. Oops. So the database has, it's not just to, um, the functions of the, of the database are trying to make it so that researchers can look as, at as many different types of information as possible. So to that end, we have the four basic tables in the database, which are reports, individuals or officers, ships, and locations. Uh, and locations are not just places, but they also include uh, duties and stations and tasks such as attending the queen or fishery convoy and things like that. Now, the reports, the report table has a list of all the reports in the database, which, which will eventually be all the reports in the, in the manuscripts uh, and all their critical data. Below that in the second level is what I call sections. And that refers to uh, the section table allows us to uh, accommodate parts of reports that have different structures that use different columns so that the, we show the minimum number of column, columns necessary. Below that, each type of report, whether it's ship deployment reports or fleet report, fleet list reports, or if it's wage and, uh, wage and status reports or things like that, each different type of report has its own table so that each line of each report is transcribed individually and recorded individually. And below that, as each line from each report is transcribed and stored in the database, there are also created these secondary lines called officer service records and locations deployed lines. And what they allow, me, allow us to do is every time an officer, or rather for every officer that is mentioned in a line in a, in a report, an officer service record is created. For every location that is mentioned in a single line in a report, a location line is created. So that way we, have a record for every every location and every officer mentioned in every line. So in the database, there are 486 individuals in the database. 32 of them are shipwrights and the other 454 are all officers. There's 477 different ships and there's 163 different locations and duties. Now of these secondary lines, this is where the numbers really get quite large. So in, in the, just looking at the deployment lines for the that main type of report, so over 154 reports, there is 1,335 rows. For the officer service records, over those 159 reports, there's 11,635 rows. And on the stations deployed rows, the mentions of locations, there's 10,058 rows. So I'm just going to quickly show you uh, the basic functions of the database. So here we can see the first primary function, which is uh, viewing an entire report. Um, this is an, a, a report from December of 1683 entitled, The Present State of His Majesty's Fleet Under the Command of the Lord Dartmouth. And as you can see here, in the main, there, the first thing you can see is a, uh, a map, which shows the location, all the locations that are mentioned in the report, and you can zoom in and out. Below that, you have the data for the the information for the report itself, including all the transcribed lines. And then at the bottom, you have a photo of the the photo of the page that the it, we were transcribing from. Now, in addition to this, you can also look at individual locations. So this one is for the Straits. 
which is pretty important. And as you can see, there's 1,656 1, lines that mention the straits. You can also look at individual officers. And the, the page here is for Cloudsley Shovel. And you can see this is all the locations where the lines that include Cloudsley Shovel mention those locations. And you can also look at the all the lines mentioned from all the different reports for, ver for various ships. Uh, I've chosen the Bonaventure just because I like the name. And so here's all, for example, all the deployment reports, all the wages service time reports, all the report, all the lines from the status reports, all the lines from the fleet lists. And at the bottom, you have the map showing all the different locations. So it was my intention originally that to for people to go beyond this and to do more advanced research on the database that they would get in touch with me uh propose something that they'd want to do i would then code it like, like do the computer coding because i've done all the computer coding for this um and then i would put it on the website and make it available for anyone to use uh, i realized quite quickly that this was impractical um both uh from a perspective of um putting too much of a load on the, the host of the website and also i just don't have the time to deal with that and so what i have decided to do is we're going to be making the database freely available freely available to people who want to download it and then um, go at it with whatever programming language and, and uh, analytical tools that they want to um, under a license of course uh, so what I'll be talking about for the rest of the rest of the presentation is that um, I have been doing a somewhat more advanced uh, bit of research, look, trying to look at social networks, or at least that was the original idea. Uh, what I'm talking about today is one example of this. I used the programming language R to create graphs from lists of relationships that I downloaded from the website. I need to thank Daniel Simeon of, Dr. of McGill in the province of Manitoba for helping me with R. And he sped, spoon fed me enough code to get me jump started so that I could create the graphs and do a bit of analysis. Um, I would like to say that what I'm doing, what I've done, and what I'll be showing you today is not particularly complicated. It is really sort of the first level of things that, became, that can be done using R and the, the specific software I use is R Studio. And there are definitely more complicated things. However, I am not at that stage yet. So this seminar was billed as being about social professional networks, and that's how I began. I, I wanted to find out who or how many officers each officer worked with, both serving on the same ship and serving on the same station. However, I realized that while I could create lists of who served with who, uh, without the, sort, the kinds of sources that are in the UK, I just couldn't come up with any kind of real um, solid analysis of social networks. However, I've realized that the data that I, I do have from my database is quite useful and I could create graphs that would show that would illustrate the connection between officers. First, I guess, as I said, serving on the same ship, then on the same station. So for this, we'll be looking at the years 1673 to 1687. Uh, so that, those are the years that I have data. Uh, that's for the same ship. And for the same station data, I'm looking at the years 1675, 1687. Uh, and the difference there is that I wanted to avoid uh, the big fleet in 1673 just because it has uh, a number of complications. And also, frankly, um, because the documents are more, or rather are less regular in 1673 and 1674, there are, there are large holes in the data from in those years. Uh, whereas the we've basically transcribed everything from 1675 until the end of 1687, so those are there is much more data there to be used. Now, I'll be showing you three three kinds of graphs. The first is a direct relationships graph, uh, and that is everybody who shows up in the data is on the screen, and there is a line between them and anyone they have a an established relationship with according to the data. So th these are quite complex. Um, the second type of graph I'll be showing you is a minimum spanning tree, uh, which is explained to me as being the six degrees of Kevin Bacon kind of graph. Uh, and they show the mo uh, basically there are, it, it's about networks in that case. 
so that even if people aren't directly connected, you can see how people are connected via others. And the third, the third kind is a bar chart that will show how many officers had how many relationships uh, for each year that I'll be looking at. Um, unfortunately, I cannot provide any uh, more direct mathematical explanations for these because they're a little bit over my head, uh, but I'm, I am working on that. I'm just, graph theory is not one of my strong points. Um, I do have to say that these numbers should not be taken as sort of the absolute reality. Uh, given that it's only captain and captains and lieutenants being recorded in the data, many more individuals who are important don't show up until they are appointed to these offices. For example, John Benbow doesn't show up at all in the data I have uh, because he wasn't promoted into lieutenant until I think 1688. So it, it, that said, the number of complex, the number of relationships, the connections, the complexities should be regarded as being as on the lower side of what the connections are, but still indicative of the general shape and of the general level of complexity as, uh, as things change year to year. So I'm just gonna switch back over to the graphs. So I will be presenting um, a bunch of different information for each graph to, to put these in context. I hope that you can see, I'll try to, where I can, I'll be zooming in uh, to make the, the names more readable. Uh, so this is the same ship direct relationships graph for 16, 1673 to 1687. Um, as you can see there, it is, there is not really that many connections between officers. Um, which is what I found a little bit surprising. And there's quite a few that are completely isolated and by themselves. So in this graph, there's 291 officers shown, 480 individual relationships. The highest numbers are Anthony Hastings at 14 and Cloudsley Shovel at 13. And the most common number is 84, or sort of is rather the most common number of relationships is one, and that's held by 84 people. So here's an example of the minimum spanning stream. You can see that the fleet really is quite connected, um, although it's uh, there's a lot of one-to-one -one and there is still quite a few people isolated around the edges. And here's the bar graph so that you can see uh, how at least in same ship relationships, there very much is an emphasis on lower number of relationships rather than higher. Um, I will be making all of these graphs and images available, um, available to anyone who wants to look at them in detail. So if you're interested, please let me know and I'll send you a link to a Google Drive. So moving from the same, from same ship to same station, uh, we'll be starting in 1675. Um, so for the minimum spanning trees, I added labels for stations and I edited some of the graphs to shorten some of the lines to make the, the images easier to zoom in on. Uh, but the actual arrangement of lines and connections are from a function called minimum spanning tree in iGraph, uh, which is part of R. Uh, and so I did not uh, mess with that in any way. So this is the direct relationships graph for 1675. I'm just trying to go back to my information. So in 1675, there are 69 officers shown in this graph. Uh, in the records, there was 70. So one person is not in this graph. The total number of relationships is 1,838. The highest number of connections is 99, which belongs to Jonathan Waltham. He was the captain of the Deptford Ketch, and he went to a lot, of, a lot of different places, serving in the Straits, in Marseille, the Downs, Deptford, Portsmouth, Brest, and he also uh, escorted the Herring Convoys. So the most common number uh, is, 80, is 82 relationships, all by seven people. As you can see, there's that one big group in the middle. As we go to the minimum spanning tree and I'll zoom in a bit. You can see that the big group in the center is the straits. And there's also a, in the Northeast corner, there's also another group from the straits. And in the Southeast corner, there's another group that's Sally and the straits. Um, 
my I can't fully understand or can't fully explain why uh, individual stations are separated out like that, except that um, my understanding is, for example, in the middle group, it's those those individuals have a, a better connection with with Arthur Herbert, whereas in the other group, they are more connected to each other. Um, I will say that people in the center of these clusters are not because they're particularly important. Uh, it's because they have the lowest alphabetical order in their first names. So you'll often see Arthur Herbert um, and Benjamin Walters and people like that in the center of groups, just because they basically each group has sort of a, an equal mathematical weight and the program has gone with the person with the first name alphabetically. And you can see here is the, uh, the bar graph showing the distribution of the number of connections with that spike on the right side for the higher numbers. So this is the, the direct relationships graph for 1676. I just have to go back to my data. So in this year, there was 63 officers shown in the graph out of a total of 66. The total number of relationships is 1,236. And the highest number of connections is 72 for James Dunbar. And then I'll... I'm sorry, I just hit the wrong key and I lost all my data. <laughs> Which happens, especially, I should explain, I have three different monitors that I'm using. And so I'm trying to skip back and forth between the left screen and the right screen so I can make sure that everything, all the screens move at the right time. All right, so in 1676, the highest number was 72 for James Dunbar. Interestingly, he only shows up in the records for January, February, November, and December. Uh, first, he was a lieutenant on the Newcastle, which paid off coming home from the Straits. And then in November, he went back out uh, with as a lieutenant of the Charles Galley, which is a, a frigate. As you can see here, the Straits is in the middle of the group and it clearly is, it is the most important of the Royal Navy's deployments. And everybody seems to be connected through there and through Benjamin Walters as well. But you can also see that there's the Downs down the bottom right-hand corner, Guernsey, Jersey, and I think Bilbao, Portsmouth, I'm moving clockwise here. Then they have Sally, the Downs, Jamaica, Tangiers, more Jamaica, Newfoundland, Tangiers, and Newfoundland and Virginia. Um, one really interesting thing that I found out is that there's often ships going between North Africa and Newfoundland. Um, I don't know why those two things are connected other than probably the trade winds, but that is a, a recurring theme that shows up. So the most the most common number of connections in 1676 is uh, 16, which 10 people have. All right, in 1677, uh, this is a really interesting one for me. You have 104 officers shown out of a total of 107. You have 3,846 connections total. And what we see here in the graph is that you're starting to get three distinct little communities here. One here, one in the middle, and one here, plus all this, all these extra things around the periphery. And that is because we're starting to have a, a fleet, not just a large deployment at Tangiers in the Straits, but also one in the Downs and the Narrow Seas. So the highest number of connections here is 146 by Robert Wilford. Um, he too was lieutenant on two different ships, first on the adventure under Sir Richard Ruth, which paid off, and then on the Newcastle, which headed back out under Augustus the Holstein. And you can see that you have, so this group here is Tangiers and the Straits on the left, and you see Newfoundland and the Straits. And these two clumps on the right-hand side, top and bottom, they are for the, the, around the Downs, Ireland, and the Narrow Seas. And then you also have a group here on the right-hand side, which is assigned to the Straits as well. And so here's the distribution. You can see that there's peaks on the left and the right for the lowest and highest numbers, but mostly it's the largest peak is in the middle for the numbers of connections. 1679, to me, it's an absolutely fascinating year. Or oh, sorry, 1678, rather, we'll not skip that. 
Um, this is the most complex and the highest number of officers. I have this listed as French war scare. So I'm gonna zoom in a bit just because it's really interesting when you get in there. So the total number of officers is 224, rather there's 224 in the graph out of 225. There's 25,532 uh, direct relationships, which is far more than any, any other year. And you can see there is really four communities here. There's this group here. You have this group here, which, so they're very much connected there. This is the, the fleet in the downs in the, in the channel. And then you have the Straits group over here and another group that is more closely connected to the Straits. But also the, the things around the periphery are very much reduced. So the highest number of connections is 410 for two gentlemen called John Elliott and John Polia, or Polly, I think. Uh, Elliott was captain of the fire ship Castle, which served in the Channel, the Portsmouth, and then the Straits. And Polly was the captain of the fire ship Anne and Christopher, which did something very, which had a, a very similar uh, program for the year. So you have the Channel fleet sort of in the middle there, and then the Straits are the two clumps on the on the two sides, plus the various other deployments. Uh, connected mostly, rather than connected largely through the, through the straits, this time they're connected mostly through the channel. And the most common number of deployments in this year was 240, which, which was 13 people. So you can see the different spikes there. Now in 1679, there's 50 fewer officers. So there's only 174 in the graph and four in the documents who do not make it into the graph. There's 10,534 relationships. So only 40% as many direct relationships as there were in 1678. As you can see, the uh, constellations around the, around the periphery are more complex. But when we zoom in, we can see that while the, the two main groups are still very much there, the intervening communities are now much simpler. In fact, it's only four individuals, John Munden, Richard Munden, uh, and two others whose names are kind of blocked. And I will be mentioning them in a second. So the highest number of connections, I'm gonna flip, now I'm gonna flip over to the minimum spanning tree. So the highest number of connections is 274 with Richard Munden and John Munden and William Pooley, who are those fellows in the center have 272. All three of them served together on the fourth rate St. David. Uh, they're in the Straits, the Noor, and the Downs, which is how they have so many connections. They were connected to both fleets. The other fellow in the middle is John Crofts, who was a lieutenant on the Swan and the Oxford, mostly on the channel in the channel. Uh, but he, because he was on two ships, he had a lot of diff different connections. The most common number of connections is in this year is 140. And you can see there's that huge group of spikes in the middle and then very, very little on either side. So in 1680, we go back to what it looked like in the earlier years, 1675, 1676, where you sort of have these groups in the middle, but that's the straits, plus a lot more complexity around the outside. Now there's only 118 officers in this graph. Uh, there's 122 in the document, so four were not shown. There's 5,152 direct connections, which is half as many as the previous year. Um, the highest number is 166, held by two officers. Uh, you will not be surprised to hear that they were Arthur Herbert and Benjamin Poole, captain and lieutenant of the Bristol. Um, Francis Wheeler was also a lieutenant of the Bristol. Actually, he's in the records for this year as Edward. Uh, but in September of 1680, he gets to, he gets promoted to command the nonsuch. So he doesn't have as many connections as uh, Herbert and Poole. So you can see here you have, again, the, the straits are broken up into two sections. Uh, but you can see there's very much uh, more emphasis on the other stations and on the other duties than there were in 1678 and 1679. Including here, for example, you've got the Balaga convoy, and you've got the herring convoys and turkey convoys on the, at the bottom as well. So 
and here again is the the mode rather the most common number of connections for this year are 86 and 60 which each have seven officers but 160 also has nearly as many with six so here's the, the graph for 68 first graph for 1681 and this year there were 97 officers so 20 fewer than the previous again the there were four not shown so the total officers for this year is 101 the number of relationships is 2864, so it's almost half the previous year. The highest number of connections is 116 for James Story and, and Robert Wiseman. Again, you won't be surprised to hear that they were the captain and lieutenant of the Antelope. And they also moved around a lot. They were in the Straits coming home. So they were at the Straits at the beginning of the year and then came back to England. Then they were at the Downs, Portsmouth in the Channel, the Soundings, Plymouth, Newfoundland, and then in December of 1681, they were deployed back to the Straits. And you can see here, the Straits is again in the center with many connections with that. And Arthur Herbert again in the middle. So it's Arthur Herbert is not just in the Straits, but he's in the channel again. And so, which is why so many of those groups around the outside have channel as, as part of what they're connected to. So the most common in 1681 was 88 people sorry, 88 connections, which eight people had. And you can see where that spike was, but also there's a big spike on the left side for about, I think that was four connections. So there was, there is again, on these outer stations, uh, more people being deployed to these outer stations and they have smaller numbers of connections. In 1682, it's almost as if the, the Straits is becoming less and less important over time. Uh, because yes, while there is a big clump over here, and that's where Arthur Herbert is, uh, there's also other clumps which are at least almost as important and much more complexity in the, in the relationships between the other stations. So the total number of officers in the graph in this year is 91. Uh, the officers in the document are 98. So there's seven who were single uh, on a ship. There's seven officers in the documents who were not working with anyone else who weren't on their ship. The total number of relationships is 966, and the highest number of connections is 46. So the, the total number of connections, the highest number of connections, they're both dropping precipitously at, these, at this point. Uh, so Matthew Elmer had the highest number. He's the captain of the Tiger Prize. Uh, and the reason that it's only one person and not two, like the previous few years, is because he had three different lieutenants uh, during 1682. And here, the most common, at this point is only five, which 15 people have. But as you can see in this, in the minimum spanning tree here, while the Straits is still in the middle and connected to everything, um, it, the other deployments are very much um, gaining more importance and doing and have more people signed. For example, Ireland over here, Deptford, Grenville Collins shows up for the first time doing, the, doing her surveying, the Straits and Turkey, Ireland and Tangiers, Jamaica, the herring, fisher, herring fishery, canary convoy, and foreign gentlemen over here by themselves in the turkey convoy. In the bar graph here, you can see that big spike on the left-hand side. Uh, and so it's very much where in the previous years, there was lots of people who had lots of connections and big fleets. That is simply not true anymore. So in 1683, things change again. Um, these two fellows down here are by themselves, just so you could see. And there's these complicated, less complex arrangement of satellites around the outside. But they are very much joined to this big fleet, uh, which I'm going to zoom, zoom in on, just so you can see how complicated the arrangements are there. There are so many interconnections there, there is barely any white space. Um, 1683 is abandoning Tangiers. Uh, there's actually fewer officers in, in the graph this year, only 85 for a total, and there's only a total of 86 in the documents. However, there's 3,000 total relationships, which just shows how many of those officers were involved with that big fleet. Uh, here, which I've labeled Lord Dartmouth's squadron. 
Um, the highest number of connections is 116 for Henry Pressman and Corbett Pelham, who are captain and lieutenant of the Bonaventure. They were part of the Turkey Convoy, then Portsmouth, then Spithead, then Lord Dartmouth Squadron, then Tangiers, and then Sallet, or Sally. Uh, you can see here that every it really is Lord Dartmouth Squadron is really uh, dominating everything, and everything else seems to be connected to him. So the mode in this in this year is 100, which is held by 11 people, uh, which is fascinating, just given that it's so much higher than the previous year. So when we look at the bar graph, you see that it's very much almost two sets of data. On the right hand side, you have the bars representing the people who were involved with Lord Dartmouth's fleet. And on the left hand side, you have the bars representing people who are only tangentially involved or not involved. In 1684, uh, we have a graph that kind of looks like Prince Edward Island. Uh, and you can see that there's, while there is on this left, left side here, there is some kind of community there. And again, another one here, uh, that there is more going on where people are separated. For the first time, I think you have actually two different sizable groups of people completely off by themselves. Uh, and so it is, this year is labeled as James is back because James, well, the Duke of York is back at the Admiralty. So in the minimum spanning, spanning tree graph, we can see that the Straits, obviously, while the Straits is still present, Salé is becoming at least as important. And so is this is sort of this group that I'm circling here with Randall McDonald in, in the center is the Channel, Deptford, um, Grenville Collins is here because he was also in the channel and then surveying. And then here we have Portsmouth, Deptford, Chatham. Up in the left-hand corner, it's Jamaica and the Caribbean. And the fellows over on the right by themselves were at Chatham. So in 1684, there's 75 total officers, sorry, 75 officers in the graph and a total of 80, so five aren't shown. There's only 808 total relationships. Uh, the highest number of connections is 70 for Randall McDonald, who I pointed out. He's here in the middle of this group here. Uh, he was, the, at this point, the captain of the Greyhound, the sixth rate, and he served in the Downs, the Channel, and then in Sally. The most common number of connections is 24, which is held by 10 people. And it's just, it, it's as if without the Straits and without Tangiers, um, that big focus for the Royal Navy has being very much reduced. And here in the bar graph, you can see that the higher numbers are almost absent. Um, but on the left, left hand side, you have those two series of spikes showing uh, connections. And so sort of, many of the officers had, connect, had somewhere between two and 40 connections or where the, the bigger numbers are. I promise there's only a few more years left. So in, in 1685, we're back to one big clump in the middle with a more complex series of arrangements and satellites around the outside. So there's actually more officers in service this year. There's 79 in the graph and 88 total. So nine not shown. And nine is actually the biggest difference between the number of officers in the documents and the number of officers in these same station charts. Uh, the total relationships is 2,308. So again, because we have that big clump, which will be a big group of ships, we're going to have that higher number of higher relationships. The highest number is 106, held by three different people. Uh, the first two are Francis Wheeler and William Cornwall, captain and lieutenant of the Tiger, which Richard Enser wrote so eloquently about in Master Shipwright Secret. Uh, and they served in Newfoundland, the Straits, the Downs, Channel, Scotland, and Chatham. Uh, and the third person uh, was Richard Trevanian, who is the captain of the yacht Saudados, uh, which at this point was in Holland, the Channel, Deptford, the River, Thames, uh, Yarmouth, Yarmouth Fishery, and Lyme. And you can see in the, in the, in the special, the minimum spanning tree that the Channel really is taking the biggest priority. So this group here is the Channel. This one here is New England, Virginia, Chatham, Sheerness, and the Caribbean. Here is Portsmouth and Jamaica, Portsmouth, 
with connections to Jamaica. And this group over here, Sele, uh, is North Africa. And so that's very much redu uh, reduced importance than it was before. And the most common number of connections in this year is 14 for six people. So in 1686, the penultimate year, uh, right? Here's our, our uh, bar graphs. You can see that the real, that the most important spike is on the left with the lower connections. Although there's also a, a sort of mound on the right, which shows, well, I'm gonna say that it shows the connections within the fleet. So in 1686, we have a total of 65 officers in the graph out of 74, so nine are not shown. There's 1,286 total relationships. The highest number is 88 from, Cap, uh, sorry, it's Thomas Bulkley. I can't, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that one right. Uh, Lieutenant of the Oxford, first the Oxford, then the Sapphire. And he served in New England, the Down slash Channel, Scotland, sending, taking soldiers to Scotland, the Hope, the Downs, Portsmouth, Spithead, and Sally. Um, and of course, you can see here that Chatham's off by itself again. Uh, Grenville Collins honestly shouldn't be in this graph because he's off by himself doing coastal survey, but yet there he is. Um, Sally is the group on the sort of the northeast corner here. That is Sally and Plymouth and some connections to Jamaica. Here we have more of Sally. So Sally is really taking over in terms of the, the most important deployment in North Africa for the Royal Navy at this point. Uh, and over on the left here, you have Virginia, Portsmouth, the Channel down Scotland, and Algiers. So the most common number in this, in this period is actually um, 72 connections, 62 connections, and 42 connections, uh, which is five with five officers each. Uh, which suggests to me that there were different groups, but that people were moving around between the larger groups. So the final year is 1687. Uh, again, we go back to the one big group, the one big fleet, uh, with then it's almost like tranches of satellites going off. So here again, there's the two different groups off by themselves doing their completely doing their own thing. So in this final year, we have, oh, sorry. I, the other thing I did want to say about 1686 is that uh, it's two more officers in the graph than 1676 and yet 50 more connections. Yet on the other hand, it's also five fewer officers than 1685, but there's less than half the connections. So that is, it's just showing, showing the importance of uh, the absence of those larger groups. So again, sorry, with 1687, this is the final year of the graphs I'll be showing you. Uh, we have, again, that one big group and then the series of connected uh, orbits of, of officers going further out. Uh, it's the total number of officers is 76. Sorry, there's 76 in the graph, total of 83, so seven aren't shown. There's 1,422 uh, connections total. The highest number of connections are 80 for Frederick Froude and George Mees, the captain and lieutenant of the Swan. And they served in the Channel, the Down, the Downs, Sally, Plymouth, the Downs once again, and then they were sent to Bermuda. So in the spanning tree graph, you can see that the Channel and the Downs is really taking over as the main deployment. Uh, here's Portsmouth, this group down here. Uh, Virginia is, off, is also, distinct and over here. And you can see the, the other various duties that were that had priority. There's a couple of new interesting things that showed up here. Uh, one is the Florida wreck, which you can see in here. Uh, John Narborough is back in service going to Florida to, to pillage some ships there. Unfortunately, he dies when he goes there. Uh, but that is just an interesting thing. I haven't seen that in a, anything like that in any other um, charts. And the other one is pirate hunting. Uh, to Fleury. Um, the several ships were sent to hunt down the Marquis de Fleury, who was a French privateer um, licensed by the King of Poland. Um, and he often had safe haven in Malta. 
Uh, it seems the Royal Navy never managed to catch him because he ended up in Austria after that. I've actually put a, uh, a link in the chat to uh, an article in JSTOR for anyone who's interested. Uh, he, he seems like a, fair, a fairly interesting fellow. So anyways, again, here you have a, a fairly globular uh, connected area in the middle, which is that channel fleet with the, uh, the branches off for, for the various stations. And Sally is less important at this point. Uh, it seems there very much has been a reversal in the priorities from where in the 1670, late 1670s, the Straits, Sally, Tangiers, Algiers were more important than the Channel. By 1687, it's very much the other way around. Not that that's really a surprise. We knew this. Uh, so here is the, the bar graph for 1687. You can see that, again, it's this split kind of formation where you have uh, a number of spikes on the right hand side, uh, and that'll be those people representing those people connected with the channel. And on the left hand side, you have the much higher spike. So the, the most common number in this in this period is six held by eight people. Uh, and so you can see that also the lower number of connections really takes priority here when you have these distinct, uh, distinct and separate and smaller deployments. Uh, so just a, a few quick conclusions. Um, it seems quite straightforward that the best way to accumulate a lot of connections is either to be part of a big fleet for an extended amount of time, or better, two fleets, um, or to be assigned to a small vessel that gets sent to lots of places and, and does lots of interesting things. That's not news, but it's really inter interesting to me to actually see that in the graphs where you can see how, where people are placed in the various types of graphs and the way that they have connections. I was absolutely surprised to see, especially with the same station graphs, that they included the vast majority of officers who were actually listed in these years in the ADM, ADM-8 data. Um, based on my impressions from reading single month, or not even sometimes it's more than one report a month, but based on my impressions from reading individual reports in succession, uh, I had thought it would be a, a somewhat smaller percentage of officers showing up in those graphs something are on the order of 60 or 70 percent rather than not only missing one or two people or seven. Um, so my queries pulled down distinct relationships so that each relationship for each year, each relationship between each officer was captured well, twice because it's A to B and B to A. Um, but I'm very curious how I think my next step would be if I took the, the, do the did the queries again, I would pull it down so that the number of repetitions of each relationship would be included so that the weight and sort of the weight of each relationship could be incorporated into graphs. I would very much like to see how those graphs changed uh, when, when relationship weight was included. However, unfortunately at this point, that's above my uh, level of skill with R. I'm gonna have to do a lot more investigation into the, into the available functions and the math to see how to make that work. Um, I, I'm also, I mean, I think with, with these annual tranches of reports, we did get some very interesting and very evocative, and, and I hate to use illustrative, but it's a great word, very illustrative um, changes between year to year to year in the various graphs that I think show very, provide really good visual um, context for how the Royal Navy's deployments changed. Um, I think be, I would love to know how much I'd have to break it down to see uh, the seasonal deployments and how things change more, even more granularly. I mean, one idea is I could set up all, all, do graphs for each of the 155 reports uh, and set them up as a video. Uh, but the, the thought of that wearies me at the moment. Uh, but that, that is one ambition. I guess the, my, my final point for now is that in terms of the actual information, it's not news that Tangiers and the Straits was so incredibly important to the Royal Navy, particularly 1675 to 1683. But for me, I mean, for me, there is a real difference between understanding that and knowing it, uh, you know, knowing the patronage chains and knowing how, who served there and what kind of importance they had later. Uh, and seeing in the graphs, in the data, how many relationships were shaped through the Straits, were shaped through Tangiers, through Sally. And, you know, just, just as a further point of that, now, of the, of the total 10,058 station deployment lines, 16, 1,656 
were for the straights. So a full 16.4% of individual lines mentioned the straights. So I think th this just adds even more weight to how important Tangiers and the straights was to the Royal Navy um, during this period. And that is my, um, actually I have, I do have one more graph that I want to just throw up there. Uh, and this is a graph, that, it's a scatter plot um, that shows the, well, the blue is the number of officers in the graph and the red is the total number, total number of relationships in each graph. Um, and it's just sort of illustrates how uh, the complexities change year to year, uh, where particularly 1678, uh, where the red is above the blue, and in 1683, where you have the number of officers declining, but because of Lord Dartmouth's fleet, the number very much does the total number of total relationships very much does jump. Um, so thank you very much for very patiently putting up with all of my graphs, um, and just thank you very much. And I will be ready to uh, answer questions. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, very very good. Thank you. Um, I hope that some of you have something to drink. Yes, we're, we're, way, we're way ahead of you. <laughs> and it's probably, oh, I thought I was about to say it's noon in Canada or wherever you, wherever you are in Canada. And, uh, maybe we'll say it But uh, well done. Yeah, no, thank you very much. I mean, there's fa fascinating um, uh, insight into what you're, what you're doing. Do you want to, you want to keep these up or? or... Um... I, I can I can possibly, yeah, possibly, I can put myself possibly, on the screen. Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a good reminder to me, you know, that of my own uh, limitations um, and some of the reasons why I don't do quantitative uh, uh, history and uh, and so on, because so much of this is 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 beyond uh, my uh, my my abilities. Um, I I but I'm very very impressed. Uh, obviously, I wanted to ask you a couple of things. One might be. When was the last time you went to Prince Edward Island? Because uh, I didn't recognize. <laughs> I didn't recognize that. Abstra it's, it's abstract. Ah, okay. Very, very, very good. Um, just remind me, if you would, you know, you talk about relationships. You, you yes. said this at the start, so it is, it is my lack of concentration. But, but define again what a relationship is. So, and therefore, therefore, what lots of them means. What's the significance of somebody okay. having lots and somebody having fewer relationships? What does that mean? So. If the way that we define, I define our relationship is, um, or rather how we count relationships is going. So what I did is I pulled up all the service, the officer service record lines for a single report. Mm -hmm. And then any time in any instance where two officers were on this, either on the same ship in the same month or in the same station had the same location mentioned for them, for their location in the same month, I counted that as a relationship. So they were so it's physically relationship, relationship might be putting it slightly heavy, but the connections. Right. So where I have said relationship, substitute connections, and that's probably or potential connection, and that is a more that doesn't that takes out the emotional and political uh, aspects of relationship. Okay, these are potential places where officers could have interacted, uh, maybe not to, maybe not intensely but right right yeah so it's, yes. it's potential as much as it's anything and it's it's proximity yes. um and that's what you're what that's what you're measuring into so somebody with lots of relationships was in a was in, was in a busy yes and they have they, and, for someone who have lots of contacts lot, lots of potential uh potential proximity to other officers uh mm -hmm. which i would then are uh, suggest has potential proximity for sharing ideas sharing experiences, sharing discussions, right? sharing books, for example. Sharing books. Yeah, so we can see how this, this could lead to, um, to all sorts of uh, different things. OK, if there's anybody um, uh, at uh, home with any questions, I think, I mean, there's the Q&A function, um, but you're, you're also just welcome to, and I think this is best, really, is just to put your hand up, and then we'll unmute you, and you can de- Anonymize yourself, and you can you can speak directly to um, uh, to, to to Sam. <laughs> While you're gathering uh, those thoughts, I wonder. I mean, it's um, I should know I should know the website uh, much better than I I I, I do, but I'm wondering if, if I could ask you about you know um, 
some of the challenges in terms of a getting permissions uh, to do this and and b um, how how to raise the profile and get the the the, the traffic that would make um, you know that all of this all of this work I mean and the enormous amount of work really that's what I should have commented on first you know, the enormous amount of work that's gone into this is is, is extraordinary and. Uh, um, you know, that, and a real, um, that, a real statement about, about, about you, really. Um, but how do how do we get the traffic um, onto this uh, that uh, all of your work deserves? Well, I, um, the traffic is. Well, let's put it this way. So I, I'm. I don't know how many people were there, but in 2013, I was at a conference in Greenwich, uh, and I sat on a on a panel with Justin Ray, and hmm. he had this website he started called British Naval History. And I joined and I kind of took it over after a while. Um, at least uh, J Justin and I worked very well together. Uh, but in 2017, we changed, we, we split our, we went our own different ways for various reasons. Um, mostly because he had a number of issues that he had to deal with medical issues. So he was frankly had a lot more interesting things to, or important things to deal with while I was mucking around with the website. Um, and so I, it's not, the thing with traffic is that we are, we don't have the profile of say the, uh, oh, I, I, it just slipped out of my head. Not the privateer pages project, uh, mm -hmm. but that pro that big project that's England and Germany where they got all the money to digitize privateers papers and things. I think it's the privateers papers project. Like we don't have, um, I don't have any funding for this project. So it's, this is something that uh, Larry Herzl and I and a couple other people have been doing entirely in our own time um so we don't have uh we, we we don't have the backing of you know universities and those kinds of funding agencies to give us the profile to get the page views mm -hmm. uh but frankly that's okay because we only have 159 documents live at the moment um i but i also don't think that to be quite frank, if one other person finds us useful in whatever research they're doing then it's all and that it is entirely worth it I know that this, like this database, which I intend to release uh, publicly as soon as possible, uh, and I'm also going to write up a document on all the various errors in in ADM8 Volume One. I know that, like for example, those will be much more useful than any to anybody else than say my PhD thesis was. Uh, so I think that these can be real useful tools uh, for anyone who comes to study the, um, you know, not necessarily the next generation, but whoever else is coming next um, to study the Royal Navy in this period. You know, to be honest, you know, I, I was talking to David Davies before I moved to England and without him, you know, without you, Alan, without David Davies, without Peter Lefebvre, people like that, I could not have done a tenth of what I did. Um, and so I'm just trying to create a tool so that the people who come next uh, have it a little bit easier. Well, I mean, yeah. um, about permissions, permissions, I do need to answer that. Yeah. Um, so permissions, is a little bit of a bifurcated question. When it comes to the the uh, information itself, it's under there is crowd. I think copyright in terms of putting the information online, that's not a problem because because it's uh, we have access to it, we can make it available. Um, the the stickier problem was in getting permission to put the photos online. Mm -hmm. So clearly, I mean, obviously, I had permission to share David's photos. Uh, he very generously gave that permission immediately um with the national archives i had to they were not in any way in opposition to the idea uh, mainly because it's david's photos not theirs um so that that is a big point uh for copyright uh but i did have i did write a letter i can't remember which panel or committee it was it was to uh, but i did have to write a letter to the national archives asking their permission to share photos of the documents that they hold uh, which they granted pretty quickly without, without any complaint, without any criticism, no, not even questions. It was just, here's the project. I mean, I think that there is no, no monetization here at all is probably uh, a significant point of why they were so willing. But I, I mean, I have had no problems getting permission um, to, to put up the photos. I, I know there would be other issues. For example, if I tried to post any photos from the National Museum of the Royal Navy, I know that they'd have issues with that because it's in their researcher form. Uh, and again, there's also stuff with CARED where certain things aren't, are in privately held and are not to be shared. 
Uh, but with ADM8 Admiralty stuff, uh, I have not encountered any issues whatsoever. Excellent. Good. I'm, I'm really glad to hear that. Um, can you see that? Um, is there something in the chat? I will pull the chat up. No, it's the q and it's, it's, it's Alan Anderson, more of a comment. Yeah. It, seems, it seems like this is a project, the funding of which would be of interest to a variety of possible sources. And well, it follows on from what you just said. I mean, are you going to try to get funding, I guess? I, I, it's funny you say that because I just noticed that uh, yesterday there was an ad on Twitter for that I for the Pearsall Fellowship, which I have now figured out I am now what seven months beyond the date for. Um, I, I thought about it a couple of years ago. I looked at a lot of different possibilities, uh, but I was highly discouraged. Uh, one, because of citizenship. I'm not American and I'm not British slash European. Um, so that automatically disqualifies me from a lot of funding. Uh, and the other thing is that I'm not, I don't have, I'm not in a postdoc. I'm not employed by, you know, I, I don't work at a university. So therefore I'm not the vast majority. I, I haven't found anything that is um, open to funding um, projects like this, this sort of like real money, substantial amounts of money. Um, I have talked to uh, the, the Society for Nautical Research and a couple of those organizations, uh, but I haven't, there is some potential there, but it, it is, it, it's, it is um, complex uh, and I'm certainly not gonna count on anything. Um, that said, if anybody is interested in funding, in providing some funding for this project, uh, they should talk to me privately and we can certainly discuss it. Let's, uh, let's hope so. Uh, okay, there's a question here in the room. He, uh, Professor Murphy. Yes, uh, I sympathize with you because if you're an independent researcher, uh, it's very, very difficult to get any funding from established funding bodies. That's a fact of life because if you're not in the university sector, you can be an absolute genius you're never going to get any money from the established funding bodies. So I empathize with you. That's a comment. That's a comment. Did you hear that, Sam? You know, I did, and I appreciate Yeah. yeah. I, I, I've never, um, I have not had any delusions about my, my chances of getting funding from funding bodies. Let's put it that way. Well, if you carry on doing, uh, doing, it, doing, doing the good work, then, you know, well, well, we're all uh, hopeful. Um, and, and Alan couldn't, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Alan Anderson, you couldn't, you couldn't hear the comment. So yeah, sorry, I, I'm not quite sure how this, this works. So it was, it was, it was Hugh Murphy asked, um, empathizing, just making a comment, empathizing with Sam's uh, plight here when it comes to, to funding, because when you're not in a university, if you're not established at, at a university, it's very, very difficult for um, academic funding bodies to, 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 to recognize you. Know, it's, it's, it's a problem. I mean, it's, 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 it's a problem. That we all that we all recognize or something, um, yeah. And that was that's where that that was. Right. Okay. Um, people are allowed to uh, stick their hands up. I think I would see them if they were. The, and, and David Davis has. And I'm going to allow yeah. you. Should I expect some tomatoes coming Tom. my way? No, I don't. I don't. Imagine. Sorry, sorry. That, that, that's Who's a private there? joke between David uh, and I. Oh, I see. Um, yeah. yeah. I think David, you're free to. You're free to speak. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. Excellent, okay, good. Very nice to hear your voice, by the way. Okay, and you, yeah, and you, Sam, good to see you. Um, yeah, thanks for all the name checks to start with. I mean, your, your check will be in the post. Um, it, I mean, I, I will certainly want to have a, a, a look at this this material in a bit of bit of depth and look at the graphs and so on and go through them. But I mean, I, I think, as you say, I mean, it is so, crucially important you know all periods of naval history arguably i mean particularly in this period um to understand who serves with whom and when and where i mean I, all right we know about particularly the connection between tangier and 1688 um that that's very sort of long established but when i think there are all these additional refinements um, that, that can be made to that. I mean, the, these are clearly um, very, very important. And of course, I mean, I think it's important to bear in mind that they actually cut both ways. Yes, all right, if, if people serve together 
we know they socialize together and and all these sorts of things we've got we've got evidence um for that but of course they also fall out with each other they argue with each other and that isn't something that's going to be reflected in graphs i mean it's, it's very often not reflected in in any form of evidence but the more yeah. we've got about who is where and when with whom i think it as you've said yourself i mean this is a starting point you can go on from this um to make all sorts of analyses um that are hopefully going to you know clarify a lot of com the complexities of naval history in this period so i mean i'm uh, like alan given that my uh, computer skills are nowhere near the, um, your league i am very very impressed and very grateful so thanks very much indeed i'm well i think it's i mean obviously i owe so much to you it's it, i very much appreciate always everything that you're very enthusiastic enthusiastic support of everything i do um i, I mean for me it, it's not just like who i really want to create things I, god knows i i'll never i can't foresee a point where i'll get to england to come look at the sources and the paperwork again in person i honestly i just i can't foresee that point um and i'm hoping that at the very least that i can throw up spanners and things that people who are there who have better access to the to the sources and the documents might be able to raise questions for other people to go chasing off but I mean, the thing about the connections that I mean, it just occurred to me that not only should I have a list of who served together, but also who was who were serving at the same time and never served together. Um, because I think that is an interesting set of things to raise about what their relationships. I mean, they may have had relationships. I mean, also, the other thing is there's nothing here that addresses onshore relationships at all. Um, and so I think it'd be really interesting to see, have a list of, for each officer who they served at the same time as, but they never served with, either on the same ship or on the same station, and to see later what kind of relationship they may have had or not. Because I think that that is also a fascinating thing, especially when it comes to the Glorious Revolution and what comes after that. Yes, well, I think yeah, I think yeah, like David, I think we're all we're all appreciative of the of the work that you're you're, you're doing, Alan um, Anderson. Um, I think you've overestimated my ability to to direct university uh, funding, but um, I, I I I certainly appreciate the the the, the sentiment. It is on the dot um, closing time. Um, so Sam, you've, you've you've done an excellent job of of uh, introducing us um, to the. Well, to the enormous, um, not just work that you've done, but to the enormous potential um, of, of, of work that can be done and uh, thanks uh, to you. Uh, and so I suppose it's just up to us uh, here in attendance. There's many, many um, of us and on behalf of the whole sort of maritime history community, thank you for uh, all of your efforts and, uh, and thank you. Um, thank you for tonight. So uh, I think uh, everybody at home silently, I'm sure, will, will, will join me in clapping and, uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's the only thing to do. Thank you very much. <laughs>